Well, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Can I just ask for a show of hands? Who was inspired by what they just heard? And who would follow those two leaders? I'd like you to think why. So my story, I guess, in this domain starts to one side there. About 20 odd years ago, I was looking in nature, because that's the sort of geek I am, and there were papers suggesting that climate change was real and dangerous. But at the same time, the newspaper headlines were saying quite the opposite. It was rubbish, it was getting colder, and it was one of those things I felt I should work out for myself. So I read the journals, looked at it, and decided this was a pro problem, and it was a very grave threat. And I told people about it, and they didn't give a monkeys. So I had to then work out what to do. If I was going to get people to listen and act, how? So I went to see this guy here. He's called Steve Henry. Uh, he was probably the world's greatest advertising creative of his time. For those of you in this audience old enough to remember the original iPod campaign, that one with the sort of guy on the side with the headphones, that was Steve. And I went to Steve and I said, Steve, how do I change people's behaviors? And he was like every guru on the mountaintop. He said, you will find the answer in yourself. In fact, he didn't. He said, go and read these 14 textbooks of advertising theory and then come back and talk to me again. And this is what I learned. Changing people's behaviors has very little to do with fact. If you're trying to create a mathematician, you don't grab them by the lapel, lecture them about algebra, and bang them against a wall and then say, why don't they understand? Because the person on the other side is thinking this. And that's the first problem we face. We give people facts, and they don't care. And we have to work out how to make them care. And this is exemplified in public health messaging, because feelings always trump facts. And that's why you don't see public health messaging campaigns against unprotected sex, drugs, cigarettes, and alcohol. Because all of those things are tremendously good fun right now, and they're all associated with some indeterminate intellectual risk downstream. And the emotional gratification of now always beats the intellectual thoughts about what might come. So if you're going to make people feel, you need to choose your images and your words carefully. And in climate change, these were the words and images. And let's just have a think about what that makes you feel. Well, if you come from London, the idea of warming is fantastic, OK? <laughs> warming is something you want. And it's nice. And change, we're told change is good, right? What's not to like about climate change and global warming? And then you see these pictures. We've all seen them. Hey, ice is falling off an ice shelf. Well, it looks quite pretty, and I guess it falls off all the time. It means nothing. We see a chimney stack. That chimney stack looks quite attractive. That doesn't look scary or doesn't make you feel anything. And polar bears, right, they're meant to float around on icebergs. Presumably, the really worrying picture would be a polar bear floating around in the sea. It means nothing. So let's change those images. And let's talk, start talking about what climate change is really about. It's about uncontrolled energy gain. The fact that our atmosphere is now gaining five Hiroshima bombs of energy a second due to climate change. And that leads to the collapse of weather systems, which we have all experienced. And that's the other point. You have to make this personal. For those of you that live in Australia, you have personally experienced this uncontrolled collapse of weather systems already with the droughts and fires you've had, as many in the States will have done too. So don't talk in general terms. Talk in specific terms. Engender an emotional response in someone because it matters to them. And the best example Steve was able to give me about this was cigarette smoking. 
Now, we've heard that doctors are trusted vectors. We are doctors and healthcare professionals overall. We are trusted. But we're not very influential in stopping people smoking. Why? Because we give people facts. And as I've said, facts don't change behaviors. Emotion changes behavior. So it turns out for a male smoker, the most powerful person to stop them smoking is their daughter. Daughters being more powerful than sons, interestingly. Why? They say, please, please don't smoke, Daddy. And what they don't say is, please don't smoke, Daddy, because you've got a 21-fold higher instance of adenocarcinoma of the lung. What they say is, Daddy, please don't smoke, because I don't want you to die and leave me without a daddy. It's emotional, it's personal, and it changes behaviors. Finally, your daughter is on a campaign. Your daughter doesn't say it once. Your daughter nags you all the time to stop cigarette smoking. And that's the final bit we need to think about. Don't run little spikes of mentioning something you're passionate about to your colleagues. Neither of the speakers we've heard first this morning just tweeted a bit, held one conference, and stopped. They've mounted sustained campaigns to change behavior. So we took this. We decided to change the framing to something that mattered to people, not about icebergs and polar bears and graphs of parts per million of CO2, but about health and survival of people and of people that you know. So we changed the images from these to these, because this is actually what climate change is about. It is about polar bears and chimneys, but it's about starvation and drought and stunting and migration and flooding and disease, and war, and displacement. And we pulled together our first commission, the Lancet Commission, in 2009, comprising doctors, engineers, politicians, economists. And that's the headline of that report. Now, like any activist, I guess you doubt that much of what you do makes a great deal of difference. But we do think that this was part of a change in messaging that mattered, because it suddenly made people think it wasn't just about tree frogs and polar bears, it was about us and our children. And we carried that forward to try to get that message out. We got our Royal College of Physicians to host the first international meeting on climate and health to say this was a health issue. We went for asymmetric vectors. Until then, climate change was discussed largely by tree-hugging, muesli-eating, finger-knitting, sandal-wearing tree-huggers. And we put together a panel of senior doctors with spies and military personnel to talk about the health and security implications to get other people to listen. We formed a health council. We're now on our third commission with another five years of countdown to fund, uh, funded by the Wellcome Trust. We formed an alliance of all of the major medical colleges in Great Britain. And we've been interdigitating in the Conference of the Parties international negotiations, where seven years ago I was one of three medical people at the negotiations, and last year there were over three and a half thousand. And the message? But those are still facts. The real message is this. These are my children. That's Fergus on the left, who's 13. And Oscar, who's nearly 17, is the one on the right. And it matters to me, and it should matter to you, because climate change will kill them before they reach the end of their middle age. That's the message. It's emotional and it's personal. That's why I am acting and that's why I want you to act as well. Thank you for listening.